We're made for community, aren't we? Just look around the world today. What do you see? People are trying to find community and relationships everywhere they go. I mean, what is it that brings 25,000 people together to watch one little dude throw a very small ball at a very funnily shaped piece of wood? And then to boast about that throw in the train on the way home for a long time, for a very long time. What is it that unites 50,000 people to go to one stadium to hear a band play a song that they've already listened to a hundred times on the car, on the way to the stadium, knowing that they're going to hear it in worse quality and smelling a lot more body odor than they were in the car? And then take a selfie with someone they've never met before, call Siobhan, whose name they spell wrong, and say, my new best friend ever. Because they've shared an experience, right? What is it about the old timers hanging out in the bar until all hours of the evening? Or the hipsters in the coffee shops all day long? Or the rise of dating apps on our phones and internet, or the rise and the weird pseudo-communities of the meme world, or Reddit, or social media. <clears throat> Whether we think about it or not, the reason why we're so driven to these things and, why, and these platforms and the, the, the desire to, to unite around something that feels bigger than simply ourselves it's the very real desire within us that's been implanted within us by God to have a community that makes us feel like we belong. We've all been designed to have that desire to feel like we belong. Of course, when we do think about it, we realize that it is indeed true. We're made for community. In our passage this morning, we're going to prove that exact point. God made humanity with an inherent need for community with ourselves and more pertinently with Him. Of course, this need for community is a further way in which we reflect the image of God, right? Because in His Trinitarian nature, God Himself as Father, Son, and Spirit has perfect community. And we, in our own creaturely way, are to reflect God in that manner by having community also. Of course, as we want to see next week, this, goes, this leads us into the place of the most intimate and vulnerable community, marriage itself. But it doesn't end with marriage. The entire narrative of Scripture is about how we are to find community with like-minded worshipers of God. That is the narrative, one of the, one of the meta-narratives, one of the main arcs of Scripture. Now, as we move into our passage in Genesis 2, you can begin to turn there if you want this morning, in Genesis chapter 2, I'm also going to be very upfront. I'm very, very deliberate. The content of this week's message and next week's and possibly even the weeks after as well, it's weighing heavily on my soul. And it should weigh heavily on yours also. The topic of marriage is something that is profoundly bigger than we give it theological credit for. It speaks infinitely beyond whether or not you are happy, but how God is making you holy. It inexorably points to the gospel of Jesus of Nazareth. And so this morning, as our Western respect for marriage is waning, our national understanding of marriage is under attack. Our personal experiences of marriage are deeply corrupted and at times extremely pained by the sin of selfishness. Let me say that I am burdened for each one of us here this morning, and you should be also. I hope you give me grace because I'm intentionally going to wound the majority of people in this auditorium in the next few weeks. Because the heart surgery to your marriage on, on your single and your selfishness and your singleness and your selfishness is so necessary. And I pray that you would allow the scalpel of God's word to cut the poison, to cut the rot, to cut the selfishness out and to replace it with the balm 
of sacrifice, the oil of true love, and the ointment of gospel clarity. It's too important for us to tune out from. So please open your Bibles to Genesis 2, and we're going to read from, chapter, from verse 15. If you don't happen to own a Bible and it's your first time with us, we're delighted you're here. You're going to hear some things that are very different than what the culture tells you about marriage and community. And we would encourage you, there's a whole stack of Bibles right there as you head out this afternoon. Take one with you and read about what the Bible says about marriage, about community, about relationships. You'll see a very different picture portrayed in the Bible than what you see in community. And you'll also, more importantly, than what culture and society tells you that we believe. Because they get it wrong. They deliberately create a straw man argument and say, you believe this, how can they believe this? Therefore, God doesn't exist or God's not good. Well, if you get this wrong, your, your equation falls apart. And they do get that wrong, so the equation does fall apart. So take that Bible and read it and come and see the God who creates perfect community. And let's read from verse 15 now. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man... and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. We see this morning... The first thing we see is, again, a reminder that you were created to cultivate creation. This reminder that you were created to cultivate creation. And it's where we left off last week, right? God has created mankind, and we saw that last week, forming this Adam, this man, from the dust of the ground and breathing the breath of life into him. We saw that Adam was created distinct from the other animals because he was given the task of subduing creation and expanding the dominion of his kind, of mankind, over it. Now, in this little narrative of chapter 2, we see this played out in a more immediate scene. God takes this man, this Adam, and he places him into the Garden of Eden. Adam, you are to work this garden. You are to be a gardener over this creation and expand it as you procreate until all of the creation bears my image with faithful gardeners and vice regents who reflect me. You are placed into the sanctuary of my cosmic temple to tend it, to keep it for my glory. And so in the meanwhile, he's being tasked with this working and keeping in the garden. God gives him this command. He tells him that he and his kind, hum humankind, can eat of any tree in the garden. It's all for him to eat. There is nourishment everywhere he looks, except one. There's one tree from which he is forbidden to eat. If he eats of it, you shall surely die, Adam. And God here commands Adam's obedience. Refuse to eat from that one tree and your position of vice regent over all of creation, of tending my garden, of serving in my sanctuary, of walking and talking with me every day in the cool of the day, that will be preserved forever, Adam. But if you eat of that tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, all, Adam, all will be lost for you, and you will die. If you're unfamiliar with the narrative, you might think that seems a little unfair. After all, let's be frank, we tell our kids or our nieces and nephews not to eat the Snickers before lunch, we're not going to kill them if we do. So it seems a little unfair, doesn't it? And this is exactly what God is saying. He commands Adam and he's saying, you must not eat of this tree. And let's not forget, every other tree was available to Adam. He's not going to starve and his obedience is not 
as disobedience is not derived from his, his need or his necessity, he's got the food that he needs to survive. And yet the command, although it appears unusual, and the consequences appear extremely severe for such a small infraction, dear friends, isn't this exactly what sin is and what sin does? Though sin tastes good in the moment, and we think that we can control the amount that we consume, and only promise to only taste a morsel of its pleasures, what happens? We consume, and then we are consumed by sin. Because sin is a poison that flows throughout our veins. It's a corruption of our mind and our soul and our flesh, and it will kill us. The consequences for sin is death. And though it may seem like a small thing to do that one thing that you know is wrong, but you're going to do it anyway, it may seem small, but it's like an iceberg. Small to the naked eye, but what it does, the roots, they go down into the depths and will bring any and all to a ruin in the moment of our weakness. Unbelieving friend this morning, if you're here and you're, you're not yet right with God, then you're feasting at the table of death because you're living a life devoted to sin. Yet the things that we do, I, I grant you, some of the things that we do, they appear to be small and insignificant. I grant you that. But dear friend, what God is teaching Adam is that it is about love and loyalty. This command, it's not primarily about whether or not he eats the tree. That's how it's manifested. That's the obedience Will Adam honor God, his creator and his king, or will Adam dishonor his God and rebel against his command? Because remember, this is the second command that God has given to Adam. The first is to rule as king, to be fruitful and to multiply and spread his dominion across creation. There is privilege and joy for Adam if he is obedient but there's death if he rebels and disobeys. Dear friends, this is your situation. As you have chosen disobedience, God has every right to condemn you as guilty, to declare you guilty of treachery against his sovereign rule. And yet he offers you Mercy and salvation. If you will turn from this sin that right now captivates your soul but tastes like bitter gall in your mouth, turn from that and instead taste and see that the Lord is good. On the cross, Christ drank a bitter cup of judgment for our sin and your sin so that you don't have to pay for it. You can be free from that this morning. You can be declared innocent because he died in our place. He died in your place. You cannot fight sin on your own. You are corrupted from the head to your toe. But there is one who has already defeated it. If you will follow and submit to him, he will give you freedom. Believe the gospel, repent Turn from your sin. Trust in Christ over all things. He died to save you. And this morning, will you respond and be free? We see, secondly, as Moses moves the narrative along, that we are created for a complementary culture. Secondly, we're created for a complementary culture. Now, this does not mean compliment like, you look nice today, Agnes. It's complement with an E in the middle, which means that you work well together. One's work is made better and more perfect and more complete by the assistance of the other. This is a doctrine called complementarianism, and it's deeper than marriage, but it's about culture as a whole within the, the community of faith. It includes marriage, and it includes the community of faith. 
I want to read a little bit more from, from Ephesians 5 this morning just to get the full context of this because even yesterday, Twitter blew up with an argument about this particular doctrine, a misapplication, I believe, of what we saw and what we see in Ephesians chapter 5. Let me read to you from Ephesians 5. Evan began earlier. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. That's difficult. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. If we stop there, we miss the point. Too often, Sadly, we men, we stop there. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as, the church, as, as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Verse 31, we take from the end of chapter 2 of Genesis. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. We're not going to walk through this passage this morning, but when the point of reading it this morning is to show you that, that, that there is a broader picture to the marital relationship than simply submission and headship. There's the overarching narrative of genuine gospel sacrifice in the pattern of Christ for both parties. Come back in a couple of weeks and we'll walk through that passage together and fully explore all of that means. So we're created for a complementarian or a complementary culture. And back in Genesis, we're going to read and see this creation of this complementary culture now. In verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and while he slept took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And we'll stop there this morning. We'll pick up the next two verses next week. So you were created for a complementary culture, a complementary culture. That's what you were created for. And into this picture that we now have, and we've gone back in time a little bit to the, before the creation of woman, and we have the first negative said about creation. And it's not from the mouth of Adam, but from the mouth of God, the creator who speaks them. He looks at Adam and he states that something about this creation, about this Adam and his situation, it's not good. There's no sin, so it's not wrong, and it's not bad in the, in the moral sense, but it's not good. And so God promises Adam that he's going to make a helper fit for Adam, one that is fit for him, unique to him, and then it will be very good, as we saw at the end of chapter 1. Now, in the meantime, we have this quite this fun scene where God begins to bring all the created beasts of the field and all the birds of the air to Adam, and Adam begins to name them. This is Adam functioning in his role 
as vice regent over creation. Here he is reflecting the creator by naming things. We saw that God ref- was, was naming the things he created in chapter one. Now Adam does it in the more, more low-key personal version of the actual individual animals. Adam, the king under God, is functioning by doing this in a human way as God did it in the sovereign, divine way. But there's something else going on here rather than simply just the naming of the animals because do do you see what's happening here? Because verse 20 also says again that there was no helper fit for Adam. So what's happening? Well, this fun scene is kind of, it's where we get our marriage ceremony from. Adam, the groom, standing up here all nervous and shaky, is at the altar And he's going through the process of naming all these animals, and they come forward one at a time. It's kind of like God brings the giraffes, the pelicans, the centipedes, and Adam looks at them, he names them, and sends them on their way. Time and time again, animal, livestock, bird, bug, all comes before him. They're all named by Adam, but they're not fit for Adam. Perhaps you remember a wedding you've ever been to. Maybe you were in it. Maybe you were a part of the groom's party and you were standing at the front. And you're trying to control his nerves. She's late, but she will come. And then you hear the voice at the back. The bride's party has arrived and and you see his ashen white face turn around and look up the aisle. And here comes Emily, radiant, in her pink gown. And she walks down, and the groom's over here, and she, and she walks over here because as beautiful and wonderful and as amazing and sweet and kind and, and fantastic as Emily is, she's not the one. And here comes Agnes, also wearing her pink gown, unfortunately named, perhaps. <laughs> and she walks down, and the groom's watching, and, and he's not even paying attention to Agnes because he's looking out, can he see someone else behind the door? And she walks down and she walks over there. And time and again, the bridesmaids come down. And time and again, they walk away from the groom because she's not the one for the groom. And on and on and on the procession comes. This is what it's like for Adam and Eden. He's got a much longer list of bridegrooms. Or brides, sorry, bridesmaids. God has given him and promised to give him a helper fit for him. And so he's trusting in that. But as the line gets shorter and shorter and the shapes don't get more and more normal, he's more and more confused. The cows ain't right. The monkeys ain't right. The birds aren't right. There's no helper fit for him. It's a comical scene. It's meant to be humorous. You're meant to look at this and smile because God is doing something very deliberate for Adam. He's showing Adam his sovereign care that, Adam, you are different than all the rest of creation. And I'm going to provide for you a helper that is fit for you. And so when Adam watches and has seen the last of the animals walk down the aisle and none of them were right, God causes a big sleep, a deep sleep to fall over him. We see this also again in Genesis 15 when God does something else that's huge for human history. The deep sleep where God then acts in his sovereign capacity as divine being and creator. And as he is asleep, God performs surgery and removes a rib from Adam. And he fills the gap up with flesh and he sews up the wound. Now perhaps you're wondering, why the rib? Not the most obvious bone, easiest bone even to get to. Well, I think the Puritan Matthew Henry has this exactly perfect. He suggests that the woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled under by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected by him, and near to his heart to be beloved by him. Isn't that beautiful? I think it's right. I think he's correct. 
because it fits perfectly with the context of what's happening here in Genesis 2. Woman is a complement to man. And man, therefore, by extension, is in need of woman. And so from the rib, God fashions Eve. Let's briefly stop and apply this act of creation to redemptive history. Bear in mind that, that so far there's no sin in God's creation. The, the, the not good, therefore, that God mentioned at the start of our passage is not about sin and moral and wickedness or evil. It's about aloneness. And because it's not good to, for man to be alone, then God creates woman out of man. And why? To help him to help him in his task of bringing creation under his dominion and to spread the image of God throughout all of creation. And this speaks very clearly about what the job is for man and woman. They have the same responsibility of spreading that image and bringing creation under the dominion of mankind. Note that it's not good for a man to do this on his own. He needs the help of woman to do it. This is significant for two reasons, that he needs woman's help. Firstly, society throughout history has gotten this balance wrong. They've gotten the equation wrong. And typically, unfortunately, in the church, we tend to get it wrong as well. Today, we're taught culturally through aggressive forms of feminism that men are worthless and the patriarchy must be overthrown. All men are part of the patriarchy. All men have to be put into their place. Throughout history, and has a particularly strong weight in the, in, the, in the church, unfortunately, it was explained that women were considered worthless in their own right. They were defined by men. Unfortunately, it was often implied they were defined by their husband. If you weren't married, you were a lesser Human, implied, never stated, but implied. In the ancient world, particularly, women were little more than possessions, sold between fathers for power, proximity, or sex. Both of these views are completely wrong. And they are antithetical to the gospel. As we've learned through Genesis 1, God created man in his image in two distinct genders. This reflection of the image of God is found in both male and female. Therefore, women have dignity, and therefore men have dignity and value and worth. And they both have responsibilities that together they bring about God's image and the dominion of creation in this created order. Together. Secondly, the second reason why it's significant that man needs the help of woman, because it is only together in working in man and woman, as man and woman, that we're able to actually engage in this work. This does not necessitate marriage, by the way, which we'll come to in a moment, but speaks of a healthy community. For many, statistically, the best place and the best way this will look out, the best format of this will indeed be marriage, but that's not for everyone. And that's okay. Regardless, if you are to remain single, then you are still to be in a complementarian community where you can faithfully serve with your brothers and sisters to bring about the end result of dominion over creation as God commanded. You are not excused. I am not excused by my singleness any more than I am less valued by my singleness. The job remains the same. My task in creation remains the same, and I am to do it. Now, there is an acknowledgement of male headship here within this passage, which we saw again in in Ephesians 5. She is to be the helper of man. And you hear that, and you think that's demeaning. I'm less worth, I'm less value, I'm less important to the task. That's not the case. God himself describes himself as the helper of Israel in this same book, the end of Genesis 49. 
But the word helper, you, you hear derogatory and demeaning, but just think about what that word actually implies. What does it imply that men need a helper? It implies you're needed to help because man can't do it on his own. Men need you. So Christian ladies, Christian wives particularly this morning, let me address you briefly. I'll address the husbands in a moment. Christian wives, your husband, he needs you to help fulfill the mandate that God has given him. You are set aside for that one man to help that one man achieve the end God has brought about for him. Wives, this morning, do you hear this? You are set aside by God for your marriage. Do you hear that? Your husband needs you. You're needed by him so that he can fulfill what God calls him to. Which means, in a very real sense, he cannot fulfill that mandate without you. Because God has put you together for that purpose. So let me ask you this question this morning, wives of Milford Bible Church. Are you helping your husbands in this endeavor? Are you a helper or are you a hindrance? Are you encouraging them? Do you uphold them in prayer? Are you protecting them with your loyalty and your love? Are you in their corner? Are you supportive and helpful? Or are you critical? Are you nagging? Are you hurtful and spiteful? Do your words build up or tear down? You are his wife, no one else's. And God gave you to your husband to be fit for him. This is a purpose of great honor and dignity. You are set aside for that one man to help him. How dare you? Allow your selfishness to cause division in your marriage and to keep you both from serving the Lord together as God intended. Dear ladies, help him. He needs you. You know that. Sometimes that help will mean sacrificing what you want in the moment to be that helper that God has called you to be. Do it. Do it because you honor him, because you love him, because you respect him. Take time this afternoon, talk with your spouse tonight in bed. How can I help you? What would, what would be what you need? Don't just think he needs help in the way that you're very good at helping. What does he actually need? How can you compliment him? Because God made you to be his bride. Indeed, let him woo you. Help him know how to do this. We'll come to this more next week. But but, but not only should he woo you, seek him out. Desire his friendship. Desire his intimacy. Desire the thoughts of his head, however weird they can be at times. How can you pursue your husband? Sacrifice your desires to that end. How can you be there for him? Let me ask you this. Have you been married so long that you think you've got it down that you don't don't even know what he needs from you anymore? Rectify that immediately because you have a position that no other woman in this world has the position of. You get to help him specifically and intentionally. He's not your personal cash machine or your personal handyman. Sacrifice your desires and be a helper for him. Rather than expect to be served, 
set aside your selfishness at the foot of the cross and follow the pattern of your king and help your husband with genuine, loving, Christ-like selflessness. That's the pattern we see in Genesis 2. Burn your pride and fulfill the task of bringing gospel dominion to the world with your husband. Husbands of Milford Bible Church, do you realize the weight of what Moses is writing? Your wives are not your servants. They are not there to make your life easier. They are there to help you be obedient to the Lord. Nor is she simply an object to be enjoyed at whatever whim you decide. She is there to help you be obedient to Christ. She is your helper. This means that she has the dignity and the value and the worth of an image bearer of God just like you. This means that she has wisdom you need to hear. They're intelligent ladies in your life. This means that she has words of encouragement to help build you up. It also means sometimes she'll have constructive criticism to help build you up. Listen to it. She wants to make you a better, more godly man. Let her help you in that regard. Listen to her. Do you see how intentional God was in creating a spouse for Adam? He showed Adam all the options in the world, and when none was suitable, he literally tore Adam apart to make her for Adam. You weren't torn apart, but there's no less care in God's making your bride for you. Your wife, therefore, dear husband, is specific to you. She is the jewel in your home, the diamond for you and for you alone. Treasure her, cherish her. How dare you take her for granted or demean her by your words and your actions? How can you raise your voice? How dare you ever raise your hand against her? When God has formed her and given her to you to protect and love till death parts you. Men of Milford Bible Church, let me ask you this. Do you pride yourself in your bride? Do you give her a platform to reach out and strive to be all that she can be, like the Proverbs 31 wife? Are you encouraging her to go out and to achieve and to be good and great for the kingdom? Do you give her the freedom to be creative, to work, to plan, to bear the dignity of being an image bearer of the Lord? Are you a safety net where she knows she can try these things and you'll catch her because you'll always be there steady for her and that you will always continue to support her as best you can? Or are you oppressive and jealous? Do you control and manipulate with your words and your needs? Is your selfishness visible in how you speak of her to your friends and your colleagues? Are you only ever kind to her when you want sex? Turn from that sinful attitude and praise God for your wife. She is a gift made for you specifically. Enjoy her for her femininity. Enjoy her for her humanity. Enjoy her for the image of God that she represents and bears. Sacrifice for her. She's not your servant, but your bride. 
How can you serve her today? Spend time tonight talking, asking her in, in the bed tonight, how can I serve you this week? What do you need from me that will make you feel more like a Proverbs 31 woman? What do you need from me that will make you feel like you're achieving the responsibilities God has given you to achieve? How can I help you? How can I serve you to that end? Compliment her in that way. Man, do you even know anymore? Or have you become complacent in your marriage and taken her for granted? Husbands, rather than expect to be served, set your selfishness at the foot of the cross and follow the pattern of your king and serve your bride with genuine, loving, Christ-like selflessness. And this does not only mean when she's being very like Jesus or when he's being very like Jesus. We'll walk through this more in Ephesians 5, but this means serve her and love her, serve him and help him, even when they're not being like Jesus. It's difficult, it's painful, at times it can feel humiliating. Show them Jesus by how you love them in your marriage. Woo her every day, husband. Spend time cultivating your marriage so that it is an expression of Christ to every single person who enters your home, including your children. May they taste Christ because they know your marriage. This means that you must know your wife. After all, she's made to be your wife alone and you were made to be her husband alone. So cherish her, love her, woo her, win her, pursue her relentlessly. During the good days and the busy days and the bad days and the tired days and the grumpy days and the sick days, pursue her, serve her. Till death do your part. That was your promise to her. Husbands, let me encourage you, keep your word. Till death do you part, pursue her and love her. So we're back to the wedding ceremony in Eden. Adam's groggily waking up. But this time it's different. In the background, the, the crows are singing the wedding march. Something's changed. And as he walks up... <clears throat> He sees God, the Father, walking this figure down towards him. Now, she's different. She's no giraffe. <laughs> See, this, one, this one's different. And he sees that. This is no creation of the beast of the field. This is no bird of the air or bug of the land. No, she is made in the image and the likeness of God. And she is made in the likeness of Adam. She's different. He notices that, she's different, but she's the same. She's made from him and she's been made for him. And what does he do? The first recorded words of mankind in all of scripture, in all of history, and they're a song of praise. And curiously, I find this utterly fascinating. They're not praising God for his godness. They're not praising God for his creation. They're not praising God for his love. They're saying, she's awesome. God, that's the one that's fit for me. They're not praising God for his godness, but praising God for woman. This, this at last, do you feel the yearning in his heart? This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She's the one made for me. And Adam praises God for her and he calls her woman because she was taken out of man, which is a Hebrew pun. Husbands, this is a word of advice to you from Adam. Praise your wife. Rejoice in your wife. Enjoy who God has made her to be. Bask in her beauty daily. Rejoice in her intellect daily. Spend time noticing her work and praising her for it. Thank her for the way she helps you. And thank God for her. She was given to you by God with all her quirks and with all her flaws. 
for you to mold and cherish to be more like Jesus. For you to learn and know and love. Husbands, become <clears throat> an expert in your bride in serving her as she enjoys being served, not as you would enjoy being served, but as she needs to be served. And date her. Deliberately make time to be with her. Not simply for her body, for her mind, for her soul. To enjoy her as who God made her to be. Laugh with her. Cry with her. Fight and make up with her. Be thankful for her. Men, date your wives. There's no greater adultery repellent known to man than public praise of your spouse. Praise her publicly in the workplace when other men are complaining about their wives. Well, Mine's not like that. Praise God for her. When the girls are together and they're complaining at all the stupidity of the husbands around, no, my husband's not like that. He's great and he loves me. I also want to say, just as a brief aside, if you're struggling in your marriage, I'm not saying lie and hide it. Find help. Don't blast the dirty laundry around the world. Seek help and be honest with your spouse and with whoever it is you decide to counsel you. Be honest, but be fair. Let me also address, because we're talking about culture, not simply marriage, let me stop and address also, <clears throat> as we close, those of us who are here and who are unmarried be it through choice, be it through a lack of opportunity, age, divorce, or death. You are not defined and you are no more incapable of fulfilling this creation mandate in your singleness than if you were married. You were able to participate in this. Adam was alone. There was only one Adam. There's an entire body right here of believers that you can plug into and work with and serve with. You were not defined by whether or not you are married. In no way is your purpose in finding a mate. You are not a failure if you remain single. There's no one here whose sole purpose is to find a spouse and be married. You are not raised to be a husband or a wife. You are raised to cultivate creation for the glory of God by spreading the image of God throughout it in the gospel. You are not raised to be a husband or a wife unless the Lord calls you to be a husband or a wife. He may do so. Statistically, that's probably the case, but it's not definitely the case. And that's okay. Because your identity is not in your marital status, but in Christ. You are redeemed by Christ. Now, in this culture, sadly, it's true, much of our identity is found in our status, status as married. And as a single unmarried, that can be really, really un unpleasant and painful, especially when you watch your friends getting paired up and walking down the aisle. That can be really lonely. It's painful. Find your identity in Christ. The isolation and humiliation of singleness is something you're the only one thinking. Get control of those thoughts. Take them captive to Christ. Throw yourself into friendships that are deep and meaningful with both genders. Yes, definitely guard your heart, but do not allow that to be an excuse to avoid deep, meaningful relationships that, that complement one another in the gospel. Be bold as a single whose passion is to help others reflect the glory of God wherever they are. You are, have a value in your singleness that is needed. And church, let's talk less of when are you going to get married and more of how are you fulfilling your purpose in your singleness. Praise God for it while you remain in it. So there's pain in being single. It's also in our culture a real pain in, in being divorced. 
There's a loss of community as you lose friends that knew you as a couple. Family functions become really awkward. And they become really lonely, particularly if you have kids and you're sharing your kids. There's a real sense of shame and a real pain that you experience. There's a loss of a friendship and a relationship that is real. And it should be grieved. Something that was whole has now been severed. And you feel alone more often than you like to admit. Find your identity in Christ at the cross. Christ took all the shame and all the brokenness that caused and results from your divorce. He paid for it. Those wounds that you have, those scars, they will remain. We're not saying they won't. But the shame does not have to remain. Embrace who you are in Christ. You can be forgiven and freed from them. And you also have a purpose. Although that relationship has been lost, you are not devalued because of it. Share your wisdom with others. Be a discipler. Be an encourager. Speak into marriages that, are, that you see that need that voice of wisdom and experience. Help singles with the wisdom that marriage is not a fairy tale. That it requires hard work. And if they remain single, that's okay. There's value and purpose in that. Divorced people of Milford Bible Church, we need you to, to participate. We want you to participate. And church, again, to the whole church as a whole, particularly Marids who are blissfully unaware of other people, seek out and befriend and give community to those who are divorced and remain single. They need community with you. And you need community with them because you need their wisdom as much as they need yours. And finally, in our culture, there's a loneliness for the widow and widower. Your friend is gone. And all you have left are the fading memories of their presence, their love, their touch, their humor, even their scent. And yes, it's a good and healthy and a, a right thing to grieve, but sometimes the pain just never leaves. Even in the midst of that grief, do not neglect your purpose and value because of your grief. Dear grieving brother or sister, your value and your worth to the church is vast. Help us know how to love to the end, to persevere to the end. Help us know how to grieve with hope as well as sadness. Refuse the lie that your life is over. You have much wisdom to impart, and we need it from you. Be involved. Be investing in the singles, the youngs, the olds, the divorced, the married. Be investing in us. Be discipling. Be comforting and be comforted. Singles of all hues in Milford Bible Church, you are not alone, and you are not devalued because of your marital status. God has made us to be a community, and in this culture of Milford Bible Church, we are all complementarian because we all, men and women, young and old, single and married, whatever way we're single, we are to participate in the command that God has given us. We may not enjoy that within the bonds of the most intimate and vulnerable relationship, which is marriage, but we get to enjoy it with a relationship that will never die, and that is the Christian bond that we have in Christ. Men, you need your sisters in Christ. Women, you need your brothers in Christ. This is a good thing. It's the way God has made it. We have a duty to perform here and now, and we are capable of doing so within the community of the church. So singles, particularly singles, let us gird our loins, avoid the temptation of bitterness, and throw ourselves into the fray of kingdom ministry together. That we may be a help to one another in Christ. And let us all here at Milford Bible Church seek to be a church where wounded people come and feel the balm of healing in Christ. We're made for community, and there's a tendency to only have a community with those who think and look very alike us, like the, the, the sports team or the musicians that we particularly enjoy. 
But the greatest uniting factor that we all have is in Christ. And so no matter our differences, be it marital status, gender, ethnicity, sinful past, or learning ability, no matter what those things are, if we have Christ, we have all that we need to have to work and live together. In Genesis 2, we see that we as humankind were created with a complementarity. Man and woman created to serve God together in a deliberate way, in a deliberate community. Where better for this community to be found than in the local church? We get to serve together for the glory of the gospel, made in God's image to reflect his image, to strive and work together to bring salvation of the gospel message to the world. Let's aim for that as Milford Bible Church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we realize this morning that we too often fall prey of ignoring the rightness of your creation. Lord God, we pray for forgiveness. We ask for mercy. As husbands, Lord, we ask that you would help us to love our wife as Christ loves the church by sacrificing and even dying to our desires and rights and privileges that we might serve her and win her and woo her and pursue her. As wives, we pray and we ask your forgiveness. that we might love and respect our husbands and submit to them as the church submits to Christ because we know that in our husbands' humanness and weakness and sinfulness, they still desire our best. Together, as men and women, genders that you have made with distinct value and worth, as single and marrieds, we pray that we would work together for the glory of the gospel in this tri-state area. May the world look in confused and excited by the gospel that they see proclaimed here. Amen.